Okay, so hi everybody. As Anne just said, my name is Olivier. I'm a happy student at uh, Le Wagon here in uh, Brussels. Um, so today we are all pleased to welcome uh, Quentin Nickmans uh, from eFounders. So um, hi Quentin, maybe you can first of all present yourself and maybe give some background about what you did uh, before you started uh, eFounders. Okay, I don't know exactly where to start, but um, I'll try to make it efficient. Uh, I'm 38, which is very young. Um, I'm married, I've got four wonderful kids, uh, six, four, two, and zero. Um, and a bunch of more other kids which are my startups, right? So uh, we'll talk about that later. Yeah. Um, I studied at um, uh, commercial engineering. I don't know exactly how we call it. Solvay. Uh, how exactly do we say that? It's MBA engineering school in Brussels. A very nice time. Uh, and after that, I did what most of the people did uh, when I was um, uh, out of university, which is um, consulting, uh, which I did very close to here uh, at uh, BCG uh, for five years. Uh, very cool time. Uh, I loved it. Uh, it's where I, I loved the um, strategic approach, the financial approach, the um, uh, thinking about businesses. Uh, you do learn a lot doing that, doing strategic consulting work. Uh, a lot of different projects, a lot of different problems, a lot of different topics. And yeah, some people like it and, and others don't. And, and, and I basically got a, a great time at BCG doing that. Uh, but coming from a family where we were quite entrepreneur, um, they build a family business, you know, at some point your dad says, you know, you're 28, you should maybe consider something else than just consulting, you know, some people do really work. Um, <laughs> so I, I, I stepped out, I had a friend who just sold a company and he was like getting free two years after and we said, yeah, why not just start together? So it took like 10 days thinking about an idea. We'll get about that later. Uh, saying, do we have an opportunity to do something, whatever, etc. The only thing we really get out of the 10, year, 10 days is big headaches. Um, and we just knew we would just want to do something together. But an idea just doesn't come that way. Um, there is no framework. There is no matrix i think i kept the matrix of all the ideas the stuff you know we can do it's like full bullshit um we started something together and in the end it's very pragmatic is that there was a company called resto presto um, which now is called resto in which is a, um, a competitor or the first company before um, uh, take it easy yeah. uh, um, and basically, I, as a consultant, I, I, I just used to eat every night in the office, right? So, I, uh, was it in Paris, in London, in, in, in Amsterdam, or in, uh, in Brussels? Why, why does that company went bankrupt? And, and was it available to buy over? I said, let's go and, and, and just see. It was for, to be sold for 500 euros. So, um, I went to the bank machine and, and, and took 500 euros with my partner and we said, Let's just see what comes out of it. We don't know if there is a business, yes or no. And, and it, 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 it started, that was our first real company we started, which went very successful, uh, and which we sold in 2009 to the Resto In Group. Um, and that was my first entrepreneurial story, right? Um, I think you guys had already um, uh, uh, heard about the food delivery business and whatever. And I don't know if uh, Adrien, Adrien Rose. Yeah, yeah. if he told you about all what it is about, right? Uh, I learned a lot about that period. Uh, we're close to 60 or 70 people in the company, uh, drivers. Um, there was no iPad, no iPhone. Uh, people didn't order by the, by the website, but with a book and stuff like that. Um, and, 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 and working with restaurants, right? And, and, and yeah. These people are not robots. And, and, and so there is a lot of logistics. There is a lot of operations involved and stuff like that. And that is where you fine tune the way of knowing what you like to do, yes or no. Uh, is that I love the entrepreneurial experience, but I hate the operations and logistics. 
And on theory, on paper, you go out of the best schools or whatever, you look at the model of the take it easy and the, the resto prestos and whatever. It's fabulous, right? And you would jump, you have this, it's fabulous. You see the economics. It, on paper, it's fantastic. And then on the field, it's logistics. It's at a certain moment, someone orders. And 10 minutes or 15 minutes later, the guy needs to cook the stuff. And, and, and 20 minutes later, it needs to be ready. And, and, and that 100, 200 times in the same evening. Um, and so sometimes things go wrong. And, and I knew for myself it was just not a way I wanted to be to evolve with. Okay. So I took a little bit of time off um, after having been sold at one month, and I worked as a consultant in uh, Deleuze, um, uh, which was uh, an opportunity. I met the CEO of Deleuze, and he said, "Okay, we're ten years. We have with these caddy home stuff. Uh, it, it's it, it's completely bankrupt year after year." So. Um, how do you manage to, to deliver um, food in an efficient and, 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 uh, and by winning money, whereas we can't deliver the, the, the just water and, and, and some stuff in, in, into houses uh, and not in last mile and, and last minute uh, orders because it was at that time 24, 48 hours in advance that you could need to order your dishes for, for, for being delivered home. And we met and we had, a, and I had again that great moment of being a consultant which is no responsibility, very high level, strategic stuff, thinking, plans, etc. And, and basically I left when it was to be implemented because in big companies, you need to really be able to um, uh, face that impatience that, you, that, 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 that is natural in a big company, right? Developing a plan, roll out the plan was a two year period. Whereas you think, would I would do it myself, maybe it's three months, and, and if, if we had more independence, we could do it. And at the end of that period, I was saying, what do I really want to do next? I love that consultancy work, different projects, thinking and stuff, and I love also the entrepreneurial world. So is there something to be bridged? And at that time, we discussed with Grégoire Destrin, Jean, uh, Guillaume Zustras, and, and stuff like that, saying, why isn't there like an active co-founder role uh, business angel, principal, or whatever, um, hands-on that it, that exists. Uh, and I met with my co-founder today, partner in crime, which is Thibaut um, Enzer. He was a very successful entrepreneur, having built a company called Fotolia. Uh, he had sold already a part of it, and he was just business angel, which was the beginning of the real period of business angels. And he had that frustration of saying, "I love to be an investor and business angel, but you know, having a bunch of equity in a company." Um, and purely being considered as, a, as an investor is not what I can do. I, I want to work on my ideas also, and, and, and I also want to be able to put more into a project. And that's where we joined together and saying, basically, we, we didn't know it would become e-founders and with the structure way we are now, etc. It was like the willingness to create companies um, in a hands-on way uh, for a period probably one, two, three years until they're fully independent and they can run their way when it is getting more rollout of full operations. And, and, and so, in an essence, the most beautiful job in the world, right? Being able to create companies have always that passion to have new projects. David is, is working on um, a project we, 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 we are kicking off now. It's fantastic to see how you bring value with an MVP and all that stuff, etc. And then came the strategy out of that uh, after having done first projects, which by chance or by, I don't know, efforts uh, were successful. The first company was like Mailjet, successful. Um, after one and a half year of sweat and a lot of work, um, it raises a decent Series A in, in a period which is 210, which was not the period as of now. Um, but it was already a very big round. Uh, the company we co-founded, Textmaster, was raising just a, uh, an A round just after that. And they were becoming independent, being able to build their own successful teams, larger. Um, and, 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 and we said, there is something happening here. And, and, and today, these companies are still alive, did their Series B, and, 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 and are growing. So that is where, as of 2013, we've been really thinking about what, how can we industrialize what are the key assets we need to build? What would be the real role of our co-founders? Who are the good co-founders we can work with in that model? Uh, because it's a different way of just starting companies. Okay. 
Thank you. That was a nice answer. <laughs> uh, yeah, and a okay, a yeah, short one. Yeah. Uh, and could you uh, tell us that if founders, so you develop and you kick off a lot of new startup, um, who has the ID? Um, what's the the starting point um, okay. for the people in the the Just room who would like to? You guys contact don't know you? at all what we are doing and stuff like that, and to 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 do it completely off scratch, right? Cool. Um, so e founders is what we call a startup studio. Um, so my job is to build startups, um, not as an accelerator and stuff like that, but building it what we can do. The way we do that is that we have a certain area of competence and that area of competence is what we like to do, which is SaaS, uh, software as a service. Why software as a service? I'll try to tell it later. But that is the set of competence we like to build. And when you do a SaaS business, there are a bunch of key competences you need to have, right? It's um, product design, engineering, um, uh, product management, uh, a lot of development and CDOs because they're heavy projects, right? It's not, as much as I hate to say, to, to, to kick off, it's not a food delivery business. Um, uh, it, it's complex. It's software and you need to roll it out, whatever it is in the cloud, and it's high margin software, whatever, but brings also complicated in R&D. You for coders and stuff, it's heavy stuff. Um, and we build over the time that type of competences, right? Um, uh, and, and we like to do it. We turn the uh, entrepreneurial um, problem around. Right? Normally people say, you come together, you find an idea, you work on MVP, you get money, and, and that's the way it rides. I fully like that, uh, and, I, and I love it, um, uh, but sometimes for a bunch of people it doesn't work. Um, some people are brilliant, um, uh, doing brilliant stuff into an industry of consulting or uh, private equity or whatever, and they just don't have an idea. Uh, or they just don't know at all how to develop that idea, and they they work with an agency or they go to India and ask for someone to develop, but they never mock up the software. They don't know how to do all the stuff. So that brings a lot of failure rates to sometimes very brilliant people that fundamentally with a bunch of other um, do's and don'ts could be extremely successful. Um, and that's how I saw myself when I partnered with Thibault. We were completely different, right? I didn't know what was a page rank when I joined him, which was like basics of, 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 of knowing just what is a web page. Um, but in the end, we found ourselves in saying, hey, he's good at product, I'm more at business development and stuff like that, why just we work together? And, and it, it turns out. So the complementarity of a team is, according to us, the most important stuff, way above everything. So we have always a co-founder on the technical side, we always have a co-founder on our business side. There, the magic needs to happen because they will live together for seven years. It's more than a marriage. They spend more time than wife and kids together, uh, for wife and husband and, and stuff like that. So that it's very important that that magic happens. That is something where there is trial and error. Sometimes it works, sometimes not. But generally, the project together brings a lot of people together. Um, uh, and we, as a job, as e-founders, complement that team. Complement with design, complement with engineering, with product management, with marketing, how to launch, with finance, trying to have a focus of the team saying, build the stuff that we think it's a good idea, it's a good pain point and we'll go for it. Maybe if you ask, I think you, ask, you would say, the second question would be, how do we find these ideas and stuff? Yeah, I, these, these ideas come there from uh, the e-founder or from the, 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 the other, uh, the two others, the CTO guy or the, no. the business guy? Up to now, we haven't, um, fell, I don't know if it's fell in love or we, we didn't meet someone with a SaaS problem or business that came to it and said, hey, I want to do it and, and build it with us. Tomorrow there is someone, a couple of people or just one person alone, of course we, 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 we do it. The, the only thing is that we have our methodology and that is something we try to, it works, it's a recipe that works, so we try to, to remain in that way of, of, of and, and canvas of working. Um, um, so the ideas, like it is, are internal. Okay. Um, uh, 
Okay, but if someone would come with an ID, you you are open to discussion. Oh, if we like the idea. Okay. If yeah. it's in SaaS, if it's in SaaS, it's a pain point for a B two B. If we see it scalable, yeah. is there a huge market? If we see that we can be very complementary to that idea, I mean okay. that is really the because we try to focus on a subset of the whole startup scene, which is software as a service and stuff, and that if we can bring added value there. Then we'll do it. Next question. A um, lot of people, when they are talking about entrepreneurship, we talk a lot about IDs, but how is it important to have uh, the ID to be important versus the, all the operation and execution stuff? Uh, what's your uh, point of view on, on that uh, team? Um, it's a tricky one. Uh, Of course, the idea is very important, right? I think the idea is as much important um, as you, you, you express how, what is the idea. If you say, uh, I want to do a, full, uh, um, a, uh, a sandwich delivery in, um, in, Amsterdam. Okay, in Amsterdam because there is no um, uh, logistics stuff, etc. Okay, very nice. The way we think about an idea is a little bit the other way around is where in, in our market, which is uh, software, which is companies, where do we identify just pain points? Okay. Um, and building ourselves companies, we come to face pain points. The, the, the um, uh, Mailjet is born because there was a project where Thibault was on, which was Press King, and, and was sending out um, press releases to journalists, and we absolutely want to track all these emails and see which is open. And it needs to be on an API with even APIs, which is immediately uh, uh, reactive, so that we could post on another email saying to the guy, hey, there is that journalist that opened your email, engage the conversation, that's the way it works, et cetera. It was not existing, right? There was no, no competitors of measure. I should never say in the word of a competitor of measure um, that were existing, so we built it. Um, once we built it, we wanted to have it translated in the, the European languages, which was uh, Spanish. Uh, so it's a hell to translate a website into different languages. Okay, these PO files and translate, and you guys know that. It's horrible. And, and, then, and sometimes you just don't know the language. And then you have someone to reread it, approve it, etc. So, so, so we said, why don't we build a, a marketplace for translators where they can just take the job per word or whatever, etc. Uh, it was also before Google Panels, so there was also the, a lot of work done by people on their blog, just writing text, SEO driven, and, and just have text and, and, and jobs created. It's a little bit less now uh, because, because Panda was there, where there were content farms and stuff mm -hmm. like that were existing. So it was really a marketplace for building text and translate it. That's, that's TextMaster. And then um, all these um, companies evolved and had a lot of recruitments or um, uh, requests coming in for sales or um, partnerships and stuff like that. And then, and then we found out that it was rather difficult to assign to what person exactly that email address, right? When it's recruiting ad, okay, um, everyone needs to receive that alias, uh, and when it's a tech person, that person needs to take the lead on it. It's always a mess, right? It was always a mess. And that there came the idea of a company called FrontApp, which is now in, in San Francisco, saying a company is different than a person in a mail, mail reader and information flow. So, so let's be just the, the, the inbox of the company, and then from there on, we dispatch and we assign to the different individuals in the company. Um, also, in the meantime, a bunch of companies grew, and it was like hell to have phone systems. Most of our companies went to the US. In the US, you, you can't have a phone, a, a web service, um, without having, when you're selling for two, three, four hundred dollars a month, a phone system. People just are in a habit of saying, hey, I want to talk to someone, see if it's a real service, and I want to ask questions. So. Um, uh, we say it's horribly complicated to build out a phone system for a young startup. Build, a, build out one here, you will pay like hundreds of, or, or thousands of euros to have a PABX. So we say, with a bunch of technologies, it's always an analysis of all the stuff that exists. You say, it's feasible. We can build out an easy stack above existing technologies to have a phone number uh, in a bunch of minutes and have an up and running phone system. And that became Aircall, which is doing 500 startups for now. And, and that is the way we just evolve on pain point from pain point. Now we're a little bit bigger into the, into the company. Uh, the companies are getting a little bit bigger. We say a lot of problems in office management, room booking. Don't know if there are issues here. We've got a solution. Um, leave management, 
uh, when you're 30, 40 people, where is that person? In what office does he work for the moment, etc.? Just creating transparency on, on office management. We don't build it. It's a pain point is the most important stuff you need to do. Once you identify a pain point, it's how big can that pain point be and how do you validate how big it can be? Um, uh, there, there is the period where you need to be able to say, we guessed it was important, we interviewed 5, 50, 100 companies, and in the end, it scratches, but it's not a carve, so will people really buy it? And what are the people that really want to buy it? Um, that's just a little difficult stuff in SaaS. You need to have something to show them because you cannot just talk about the idea. You need to show your product and have it implemented, even if they don't pay for it, and see how they use and behave with it. Once you're getting traction there, you know you extremely rapidly in SaaS businesses if you have a good business or not. Because there, it's what I call the magic of enterprise software in SaaS. Um, with 100 clients, you know if you get a good business or not. You know exactly how to pitch it, you know exactly how much money you will need, you know exactly how to scale it, yes or no. It's like telecom businesses, it's every month, you have something that comes in, you can calculate how much effort you need to have to acquire a client. Um, so you have simple metrics, which are called cost of acquisition of a client, lifetime values. Um, and there, it's where I think SaaS model is very adapted to the studio model. Um, because you can finance an MVP with a studio with a bunch of corporates or financing people were ready to, to play the game. And after a relatively short period, you know if you have a business. You don't, we will never build Facebook or Twitter or whatever. It's just not possible for us. We do something very rational saying there is a pain point. Uh, we'll build software for it. We see if people pay for it and how much they pay for it. And then we analyze, is this a business, yes or no? And we try to do that in 12 months. Back about e founders, you, uh, you started in Brussels but you are already uh, in Paris, I think, and other cities. So what's your, your plan for the future for eFounder? Do you plan to grow uh, massively in Europe or what's the future? Um, the reason we are in Brussels is that Thibault and myself are from Belgium. Um, the reason we are in Paris is that there are three first companies and co-founders. We're from Paris. Um, Fotolia and Thibault being much, just have an ecosystem there. Um, it happens that we started there and the ecosystem is just bigger. Um, there is no other rationale, right? Okay. Uh, we don't need specifically to be in a city, yes or no. The only thing we learned is that having like a co-founder from Paris and Brussels doesn't work. Um, we just need to have a co-founding team which is on the same place, that is important. Um, and relatively regularly be in contact with bunch of experts and most of them are in pairs. So okay. um, we up to now don't have like a core bunch of expertise that is really built out in Brussels. Uh, might be in the future, probably. Uh, and, and people uh, end up, uh, our companies end up being where the co-founders want to live and do. Uh, the only plans we have is a serious thought about how to go to the US. Okay. Um, which is a very complex uh, question um, yeah. uh, about uh, how to ideally do it. Because either you do it extremely early on, uh, the, the, the Davy, uh, uh, Louis, uh, Davy Kestens, uh, Louis Ronquet, they, they all they did is move completely and, and, and go the full fledged US story, uh, funded by US funds, uh, Delaware C Corp, uh, um, you know, everything in the valley and all that stuff. Two of our companies have done that now and are doing it. Uh, the only thing is that it comes with a lot of sacrifices for part of the team. Um, that model is not always fully compliant also with the stuff that you have extremely good talent in Brussels and in Paris. Uh, and once you're there, it's not that easy to manage a double, in, uh, a double entity, etc. Um, and in the end, um, why are you going to the US? Is it just for funding? then I don't think it's the right stuff. I think you need to go to the US when your market is there. And if you go there for a market, it's for business development, for sales and marketing. So what we're thinking of is maybe create a third hub in the US, and we don't know where, what, whatever, going next week to start to explore, just for bringing 
our projects, our hub where they can land and say, we can do business development here in the US and we'll see if it ends up being at a very important yes or no. Um, the US is a huge market for internet and SaaS based companies, huge one. So you almost need to be there. Um, but does that mean that you need to completely switch over the whole company immediately? We did it twice and I'm not sure it's the only way uh, it makes it possible. So we might just trial it another way. Because a lot of uh, people will say that the market is easier, there is only one language. So maybe it's just easier to start while in, even in Belgium, you, when even you start, you from scratch, you maybe have to, in SaaS to, to translate in two language. Maybe the legislation is more difficult. So I'll uh, give you a discount code for text yeah? matter and you can translate ah, your okay, website easily. Perfect, thank you. Um, <laughs> It's not, it's not about translation. Um, I think it's more about when you're in the software industry, right? In SaaS business, it's more about m uh, uh, conjunction of elements. First one, uh, the maturity of software as a service in general and tools is bigger in the US, right? Um, you have uh, trading happens in New York, Singapore, and London. Well, software development has always happened quite a lot in Silicon Valley for the ages. Um, even if like MailChimp is from Austin, Texas and, and Microsoft is from Seattle, whatever, it always have been quite a lot from the US. So they're just further away. They, they think about um, software another way that we think. It. We, it's solving stuff in our case. In their case, it's like we can build a software and, and, and whatever the little stuff that it brings, the software can become huge for whatever reason. Um, that is the first stuff and, and they're therefore first in a lot of dimensions. And if they're first, you have that first mover advantage and it's software, there is no local dependency. Yeah. If there's no local dependency, you guys can all read English or speak it, so you can buy the software also. And I bunch a lot of your tools use American software. Um, the second element is the maturity of the local markets. Um, uh, I don't think it's as easy to sell software to support centers like KLM or France or whatever cloud-based um, than it is uh, for the same um, software now to sell it to Delta or United and stuff like that. There is just a, a software and a cloud adoption um, that is bigger in the US, uh, that there are more willingness to test new tools and stuff like that. So for the software industry, the market opportunities are first there. Um, but, and I think it's an important but, generally all these software are made for the American industry. And you have a lot, a lot of local ways of tackling the same problem that European companies, small and medium sized businesses have and that US pro uh, companies don't have. Um, okay. uh, I don't know if you guys heard about companies like Zenefits. Um, it's benefits management, right? It's um, mutuelle in France and uh, assurance maladie uh, for companies in, in, in Belgium, uh, DKV and stuff like that. Um, it's a completely other way of handling with employees and stuff like that in, in the US and mm -hmm. uh, as within Europe. Yeah, sure. um, and therefore there are huge opportunities just by looking successful stuff that happened there and say, and translate it with your European eyes and saying, okay. why not? Uh, why do we wait that they come over if we have an edge of being just locally more knowledgeable about it? When you think of um, the UK, France, Germany together, it's about what, 200 million people about? If you take these languages and you expand and you take the French part, it's a huge market. It's two thirds of the US and you just have three languages. If you do Spain, there, you also have Latin America. Uh, why not? You, yeah. you can also do it. It's just more fragmented, different cultures, uh, more local cities and whatever. That's the only thing. Thank you, Quentin. Uh, we will switch to the question of the public so that we will uh, be on time for the one who want to take some beers after the, the meetup. Um, Generally, the people we co-found business with have, for the business person, quite a good academical background. Um, 
Uh, it's not that uh, people coming out of the garage can't build a company. Um, uh, and, and, and I'm sure that everyone can contradict me or whatever, but in the end, the person who went to a bunch of business schools and had a bunch of academical uh, competences in management and stuff like that are probably be better armed on an equal footing to succeed because a startup is also a company, a company to be managed with finance, with stakeholders, with investors, with marketing, with sales, with people's problems, with hiring, with culture. And voila, it, 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 that is the first thing It's academically uh, quite good. They need to have a real passion for web uh, tech uh, in general, um, to have a very strong entrepreneurial mind because building a company is a real roller coaster. Uh, it takes seven years, 10 years before uh, you think you can really sleep and, and close your two eyes and say everything is going well. Um, and we end up, uh, and then he, he needs to have a real magnetism because it will be a team leader, right? It's someone who, who will have to hire the best ones, um, who will be able to create that atmosphere. And, and that's not a gift for everyone. Um, I would not be a good CEO. Uh, yeah, there are a bunch of dimensions I, I, can't, I can't comply into that. Um, uh, the technical co-founder is different. Um, he needs to have the passion about the stuff. He needs to have the strong technical background. Um, uh, naturally, but I think there is the the, 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 the the strong strong fit that needs to happen with the, the business person saying they know um, how to trust each other fundamentally. If the one can sleep in, in, in his two eyes because technically it will work, and the business guy can, can and, 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 the, and the technical guy say he can sleep on his two eyes because he knows that on the business and marketing side either everything will happen and roll out, there the magic happens. Um, if it's someone that has no idea or whatever, uh, technical or business-wise, I think we see like we see 304 applications a year, and we end up building three companies a year. So um, what happens is that we meet a lot of people, uh, and and we just see if it's the right moment. And uh, sometimes we just meet people we're fantastic about, but if they don't love the idea, the idea or the problem we want to solve, we just don't work together and we might work on a later stage. That is for the person who doesn't have um, a project, let's say it that way. If the person has already a project, which happened, we just need to be sure that that project fits into what we call our circle of competence. We are good at building SaaS businesses oriented to small and medium sized based businesses. If you build a SaaS for BNP Paribas, I won't help you. I, 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 it will be a very complex uh, system adapted to very small niche of stuff. You will be able to sell one license for millions. We don't do that. We like to sell s with a long tail of clients. Uh, Mildred is something like 25,000 clients. I think uh, TextMatter has eight or 9,000 clients. That's what we like, you know? Average so sell per, per company, 100, 150, 200 dollars. If that's the average sell, that's our sweet spot. That's where we're good at marketing it. That's where we know how we can build, uh, bring value to it. If it's not in that circle of competence, that will be a first um, reason for rejections, right? The second element that would be is that if you're based in Barcelona uh, and say, I want to work with you guys, it will say, there are a bunch of conditions, right? Um, we'll need to relocate and work with us for probably 12 to 18 months, either in Paris or Brussels, because we know the magic of um, building something together just also works by taking beers together, um, uh, having lunch together, getting to know these people, and that it's that way that it, 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 the magic just happens. Um, we tried it before, a bunch of other people tried it before, uh, accelerator on distance with Skype calls, etc. That is content. There is more than only content by building a, a company and a story together. Um, I will open it. We'll, 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 we'll definitely look at it. Uh, th there is SaaS on vertical businesses. You know, there are people that are working on just software for haircutters and saying, uh, I know that business, I've been around, they just have a lot of problems, and that's the pain point. And I've been interviewing these one or people, and I want to build SaaS, but I don't have 
technical skill, I don't know how to market it, etc. Are you interested to doing it with us? And then we'll deep dive it for a month or two with our teams looking at it, also doing interviews, see how we can build it something together and whatever. That's typically how we, we, we like to operate. Um, but it needs to be SaaS. Yeah, that's good. I think that's clear. Next question cool. is what? So we, we, uh, there is no one that is bankrupt for two reasons. Sorry? Bankrupt exactly. Um, the, the, the first reason is we don't incorporate a company immediately. Uh, there is a reason behind that is that I do think that whenever you create a legal entity and you have shares and you have all that stuff, it's not a project anymore. It's a company and you will, you will continue to be sometimes obstinate about that idea which has a tagline and something written in the bylaws saying that is what we saw. And um, sometimes you have a brilliant team, really brilliant team, but just a bad idea or, or a pain point where in the end it's not a good one and we just need to flip or whatever. And it's much easier when you don't have a company, right? And when you say, shh, shh, erase. So we do all take all that risk on the PL of the, the lab, what we call e founders and e founders Paris, which is the lab. We pay people, um, they work on it, and if it succeeds, we create a company. We get three stages of create in the creation process. Um, the second reason is uh, the only one which was not, like, not too much surviving. Uh, generally, you, all, you, read, you build a bunch of technology, and People, bigger players, smaller players can be interested in just in your technology and you sell out your technology for a bunch of euros and stuff like that. It's still software that can be used by other big players that can integrate and use your technology. It's different than a B2C a client list or whatever. They're not always interested in future the client list, but more about the piece of technology you build. But we stopped a bunch of projects, if that was the question. I still have a tree now. It's the first company where that was existing when uh, Thibault and myself started. It was a company called Presking, which was PR innovation, very difficult market PR, um, uh, still very linked to journalists and stuff like that. There's a lot of humans. Software will not completely transform it immediately. Um, uh, and it basically is um, a company where the software was sending out press releases and advices to bloggers and uh, journalists. But we also had the, the monitoring side um, to show that it was efficient to send out to the debate base of, of journalists and all that stuff. And um, um, it ended up that these two functions of sending out the news and monitoring it would be more um, efficient if we separated the two functions of the of the of the of the software. Uh, you monitor every day. You listen every day. It's uh, co the company that took out that technology is called Mention. I don't know if you guys use it, but it's a, a very powerful uh, a monitoring tool uh, where you can monitor keywords for your industry uh, to find prospects. You can monitor competitors. You know where they go and what type of uh, Events they go, you monitor their, their news about them, yourself, the name of the CEO and whatever. It's a Google alert on, on steroids, a really uh, 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 media monitoring uh, solution at large. But that part of the technology, we, take it, we took it out because for that technology, you can charge monthly a little fee to continue to use it because you use it on a daily or weekly basis. Setting out a press release, you do it twice a year if you're a SME. And, and you're a very active SME if you last it two to twice a year. So there was a conflict of usage between the two parts of the system. We said, let's split it. And the part of Pressking basically alone sending out releases and having a, uh, it was a press um, page that the, 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 the guy from the PR could automatically animate with templates and stuff like that. It doesn't bring, it doesn't scratch deeply enough that you pay a lot for it. And so we said, okay, it was like, we had hundreds, 200 clients was, I mean, almost profitable because it was two, two man company or three man company. But we, we're not there to build out small companies that, we're there to build out companies that 
will become, we hope, all unicorn potential companies. That is our job. We need to focus our efforts on the most successful project. Yeah. To a player who was not technology enabled and was doing a very good sales job and stuff and saying he could sell that technology much better than I would do because I would do outbound sales and stuff and that's it. You don't do Y Combinator or 500 Startup to validate your idea, right? When uh, Front went into YC, they already had their first customers, users, for a while, uh, the system was getting paying three months before they entered into the program. So we knew about what we were doing, where we were going and whatever. And, 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 and I encourage you, if you want to do that type of accelerator, you're always better off um, doing it even later. Uh, another company you might know is Algolia. Algolia was almost Series A funded when the European Series A funded. Uh, had raised like a million and stuff like that and did YC after that. You need to do an accelerator um, uh, for a specific reason uh, that is required for the company, right? And the reason was that front, I don't think it would have survived in Europe because it's a very broad vision, very software oriented, very long term um, uh, philosophy, which was required to be in Silicon Valley. And so Sometimes we say that um, and, and, and we are very weird animals as Europeans when we go to Silicon Valley, right? Uh, so what do you do to, to be a little bit more accepted in an ecosystem? You don't go to Silicon Valley and, uh, and meet with the hundreds of VCs and say, hey, how are we doing, mate? Good. I'm here for two months. You want a meeting? Give me some money and then I go back to, to Belgium. It doesn't work that way. So the way of going to a, 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 an incubator um, and, 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 uh, and an accelerator is really in the sense of uh, the word acceleration. It's accelerate your presence into the, the, the US ecosystem. That is where we see it. And when I talked about it before, I'm not sure it's the unique way uh, to enter into the US market. You have a lot of very successful European companies. Last one is Voxbone. No one thought about it, but it was a, a beautiful exit. Um, one of the, the, the US business head of Voxbone is now CEO of Illustrio, one of our Brussels-based projects. Fantastic project. Very senior, very bright and a clever guy. Um, the company was a, US, was, was a Belgian company, right? It's sold to Americans. It's not because there were no external VCs. It was a Belgium-funded private company that did a huge success in the US just by being present. It's not only the accelerator way, etc. Uh, and that is where we are thinking of it and saying, do we are obliged to, to send the teams to the accelerator or is there another way of being a hub for SaaS companies, uh, European SaaS companies, of a French and Belgium uh, SaaS based companies to build out a presence and how? I tried to share my time between Brussels and Paris. Um, and even in uh, the full beginning, I don't think you need to be 100% only in the same office, right? Uh, uh, and thirdly, um, eFounders is like a company that is now a co-founder. It's n not anymore just individuals. Uh, that's what we try to achieve. It's a set of competence. We, um, I bring probably more value a little bit later at, at the later stage than Thibault, which is really more a product guy. Um, uh, at some points, there will be more design team that will bring a lot of inputs into the, 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 the project and stuff like that. So it's a global presence of a team that you can uh, count on. Um, uh, but the second part is, yes, we do both travel quite a lot. Approximately two days a week, we're in Paris. Um, for the moment, we went through a bunch of stuff. It's a very difficult economical model, right? Um, we co-create companies. We are shareholder in the company, but we pay the bills of everyone, expert teams and whatever. And in the end, what we get is just paper of 
a shareholder book, where we hope one day either it provides dividends and will pay back a little bit, which is just a company that doesn't need specifically to cash burn a lot, which I hope we will build one day, uh, um, or an exit, or partial exit, or whatever. And that takes time. On average, people say it's about seven, eight years to exit correctly in a SaaS-based business. Um, so, so the, the, the in French it's besoin de fonds de roulement. How do you say that in um, uh, the, the cash? The, 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 the working cap. The working cap is like it's not a nice curve um, in, in our opinion. Um, on the other side, what you build is valuable, right? They get equity rounds, they get revenues, they get teams or whatever. There is something that is being built. What exact is the, 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 the market value of that? Except the equity round, you cannot really tell. So you know that your, your working cap is on theory uh, worth something. And that equation is extremely positive on e-founder side. So um, um, two options, exactly like you tell. Do we do earlier exits to reduce the working cap and to have the first exits that feed toward the continuous working cap? We thought about that and everyone said you're completely crazy, right? When you get a good project, normally everyone doubles down and tries to be the biggest shareholder or whatever and, 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 and try to, to, to have a bigger stake into the company as financing. And you do exactly the contrary. You, when you have a good one, you sell your participation very early on. Completely stupid. Well, okay, you go back. It doesn't solve my working capital problem uh, again. Um, so the way we uh, think about it is that we will probably go until the exit quite later stage. Secondly, um, you have people that create liquidity into a company and they're called venture capitalists. They have the rights in the shareholder agreements and stuff like that to create uh, windows of um, uh, liquidity. So there might be options there if we want to deleverage a way or another, exactly like founders do. Uh, I mean, exactly the same principle. Um, thirdly, to reduce the working capital of e-founders, what we are thinking of is that we have two roles into a building a company. We have a co-founder role and we have a financial role. And we, we are thinking uh, very hardly to completely split these roles, even in the cap tables and the, and the mechanism and stuff like that, saying, why do we do these two roles? Whereas basically the financial role, we could completely outsource it. The only question that is very important in the outsourcing of the financial world, there, there cannot be any signaling issue. Signaling issue is being, I fund the project from a financing pocket just because I need to pay the bills of the studio. That is not possible. So that is the re really complex metrics that we are trying to solve, which basically I think we solved. And, um, and it will end up by building out a side fund, uh, giving access to financing people to be systematically in all of our successful projects, those that we No, in the meantime, um, eFounders has raised a bunch of money from what we call a big angel investor, uh, uh, which makes that we are sufficiently cash flow positive or with cash for the two coming years. Um, and we basically hired two people that will be dedicated to build out that fund. Um, you cannot build out a financial fund just by uh, overnight. I mean, there's a lot of compliance into it. Um, there's a lot of signaling stuff that you need to build out and to be sure that you do it correctly. And so we are hiring two people, amongst which one will be full dedicated, just doing after that LP fundraising, uh, continue to monitor that everything is okay in the shareholder agreements and stuff like that. I, like, I, I always like the question. Um, Rocket Internet is also a company builder, right? So that is completely the same. Um, the focus of area is completely different. The one is building software, the other is building e-commerce and very cash intensive models. But with one fantastic element, because they're clever guys, and that's maybe why they're valued that much, is that there is not so much risk into them all. They take proven 
internet-based business model. They copy booking.com, huge success model, business model, just words. So they, they just try to copy it and bring it in other geographies. Um, that is the first fundamental difference is that they are only on execution. They don't have to do the innovation part and the trial and error part, uh, which is very different in our, in our model. Secondly, if you're only focusing on the execution, um, you can master the whole company all over the, the way, right? And doing a lot of shared services and stuff like that. Our companies, as software companies, need to be independent. And so the fundamental final difference that it also brings is that the equity deal and the involvement that you have as a studio is completely different. The one will have like 95% of the company, which is called Rocket Internet, providing more a CEO, a bonus of equity for forming and running the project because you know exactly the plan to run, you know exactly the finance to get. It's more like running a plan. The other is a co-founder. We will need to build out a team who will have to solve 20 questions that will arise over the 18 coming months. It's not the same set of competence. It's not the same set of people that you can work with. And so you need to give him a lot of equity also because he will also go through the fantastic role of The equity split is um, generally after two years, co-founders have 50% of the company. Uh, and e-founders in a financial role will, will have finance. Depends on how much the founders spend also, right? You have founders that can spend a lot more. So we have an envelope, which is a quite large one. Um, they can use, uh, they can, they're not obliged. And, and we still, uh, it's not a free check. So we still need to validate that everything is going well, that we can to, to, to finance it. Um, uh, and, and they go the further they can with that money. Uh, if they want to pay themselves a lot, they will need to raise money very early on. If they don't pay themselves, they might raise much later, etc. That's the, the, the equation we bring. But in the end, our letter of intent is that half of the equity goes to our co-founders. Okay. Thank you, Quentin, for this interview. And uh, for the others, we were shy and have questions. We Feel free. invite everybody to go upstairs for a beer and don't hesitate to ask your question to Quentin. Cheers. Okay. Thanks so much.